I'm asked all the time whether it is very discouraging being in Congress, particularly as I do believe in the Constitution, as our founding fathers meant it. In fact, I carry a copy of the Constitution in my pocket at all times. And I've read it, what our founding fathers have said about it, and I highly recommend that you do so, and I recommend that you get your family to do so, your colleagues to do so, and anybody within your sphere of influence. Article 1 of the Constitution lays out the parameters for Congress. And in fact, Article 1, Sentence 1, well, Article 1, Section 1, Sentence 1 says all legislative authority is vested in the Congress of the United States. What that means is that from the original intent of the Constitution, federal judges, even the Supreme Court, have absolutely no constitutional authority to create law. And in fact, no president has uh, authorization under the Constitution to create law either, and we see presidents of both parties doing so through executive order. We see the, this administration in particular, but previous administrations creating law through the regulatory process. And we've seen this president not care about even what the American people think. That's why we got Obamacare. If y'all remember when Obamacare was proposed, the national polling was showing that three out of four Americans did not want Obamacare passed into law. But Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, and Barack Obama forced it down the throats of us as well as our patients and the American people. Obamacare is a destroyer. It's going to destroy your ability to deliver the quality care to your patients that you have been so ably trained to provide. It's going to destroy budgets. It's going to destroy family budgets, businesses' budgets, states' budgets, as well as it's going to destroy the federal budget. And it's going to destroy the quality of health care across the board. In the debate on Obamacare, I introduced what I call my Patient Option Act. My Patient Option Act in the last Congress was 106 pages. We've added another page. It's 107 pages now because the Patient Option Act would pull Obamacare out by the roots and would replace it with a comprehensive health care plan that would stop CMS from making health care decisions. It would stop CMS from setting prices. It would totally get rid of SGR. In fact, let me just read the beginning paragraph of this bill. It says, a bill to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 to repeal the percentage floor on medical expense deductions, expand the use of tax-preferred health care accounts, and establish a charity care credit to amend the Social Security Act to create a Medicare voucher program and reform entitlement requirements, to amend Public Health Service Act to provide for cooperative governing of individual health insurance coverage offered in interstate commerce. And then it goes on being enacted. This is the whole bill, 107 pages. Not 3,000 like Obamacare. I'm very hopeful, my dear friends and colleagues, because of just recently the Obama administration, y'all may have seen it, have said that they're not going to appeal the ruling of the 11th Circuit, three-judge panel to the whole of the 11th Circuit, which means that Obamacare is going to be appealed directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. Absolutely. And the importance of that, in fact, I'm not sure, I've, I've described this administration in three words, arrogant, ignorant, and incompetent. And I think those three words, are go, uh, it, just what their decision is on this issue, what it's going to do is that the U.S. Supreme Court very probably is going to hear 
Obama, the Obamacare appeal first of next year. So we're going to have a finding given by the Supreme Court in the middle part of this next year's election. I think this next year's election is probably, truly, the most important election you'll ever see in your lifetime. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is that if we do not have a president that will sign a bill to repeal Obamacare and put in place some common sense, market-based, patient-centered health care policy, if we don't have that happen in early 2013, and Obamacare takes full effect in 2013 and 14, if that doesn't happen, we're going to destroy our liberty. We're going to destroy the economic base of this nation. And your grandchildren's pockets are going to be picked to the point that they're going to live at a lower standard than we live today. But I'm very hopeful about the direction we're going. I led the effort in the U.S. Congress to get members of Congress to sign an amicus brief in the Virginia case with Ken Cuccinelli, the Attorney General, challenging the Obamacare requirement, the individual mandate requirement for individuals to buy health insurance. And it's blatantly unconstitutional, as we all know. We weren't involved in the Florida case, but once it's appealed, I've also led the charge with ACLJ in Washington to file an amicus brief on these appeals. And we'll continue to do so. We'll file an amicus to the Supreme Court now that it's heading that way. But it's going to be a huge political issue that you can talk with your patients about health care and your inability, if Obamacare goes into full effect, to give them the kind of care that you're trained to give them, that they've been enjoying all this time that they've been your patients. Seventy-four members of Congress signed that amicus brief. And it's going to be a huge issue in next year's election, which is going to be great. I not only introduced this bill, but I introduced another bill after Obamacare passed into law that I was trying to get Democrats to introduce. It's not a comprehensive bill like my Patient Option Act, but it's one that I felt would be a good start. Now I've visited a number of Democrats and told them that I would give them the legislative language. All they had to do was write their name in a blank, and it could be Obamacare. It would do four things. The four things are included in this bill also. But that other bill would do four things. Number one is to allow individuals and businesses to buy health insurance across state lines. The second thing it would do is allow anybody in this country to join an association pool so that you'd have these huge pools all across the nation, which would markedly lower the cost for everybody. As you all know, it spreads the risk, so health insurance costs through these pools would be much less. Third thing it would do is it would stimulate the states to set up high-risk pools for those who are uninsurable. I've talked to the governor of Mississippi, Haley Barber, personally about their high-risk pools. Anybody from Mississippi? A couple. Y'all got a great governor who's a good friend, and I was talking to Governor Barber about that, and it's been, according to him, very successful in that state. Colorado also has done so. But then the fourth thing my bill would do, which would be a, probably the biggest issue to help lower the cost of health insurance, would make all health care cost 100% tax deductible for everybody. And it includes every health care cost, including insurance. But I would go and visit one of my one, started with the Blue Dogs, and I even got all the way up to some of the most liberal members of Congress in the House and told them about that bill. I wrote an article Got two other Republicans, one from uh, Pennsylvania, Charlie Dent. Got one from Arizona, Congressman John Shattuck, who's been pushing for the cross-state 
line purchasing for a long time to co-author the op-ed in the was that was printed in the Washington Times challenging Democrats to introduce that bill. I had Democrat after Democrat say to me, Paul, this makes more sense than what we're doing. This is a great first start, but I cannot do what you're asking. I cannot introduce that bill. I cannot introduce it because my leadership will punish me if I were to do so. You see, the whole debate about Obamacare was whether we were going to have a single-payer system, whether we were going to have a robust public option, or a public, or a public option light. And that's what we wound up with, as you all know. But the whole bill was guaranteed to fail. It was guaranteed to push everybody into what the president said he wanted to do, and that's to have everybody in this country in one pool. He wants to make all of us GS-16s, or maybe even GS-12s. That's what he wants. And that's what Obamacare is guaranteed to do. So that's the reason we have to pull it out by the roots and replace it with something like my Patient Option Act. I'm really excited, frankly, because I believe we're going to see a new day in American politics. Last year's election was just the beginning of that process. We elected 87 new Republican freshmen. We've added two more since then, so there are 89 Republican freshmen. And a lot of them are talking about constitutionally limited government. Now, a lot of them don't really understand what that truly means. I'm trying to teach them. But we've got more conservatives than we had when I first entered Congress two Congresses ago, well, three Congresses ago, in the 110. And I think we're going to do that this year, we're going to, or next year. We're going to add more conservatives. But it's absolutely critical for us to have a president that will sign a repeal and replace bill. It's absolutely critical for us to change the U.S. Senate so that we'll have a Senate that will pass that bill and add more conservatives in the House to do so as well. And it's up to you. You see, the most powerful political force in America is embodied in the first three words of the U.S. Constitution. And our founding fathers believe that so firmly. I know those in the back can't see, but if you look at the, at the wording of the U.S. Constitution, the first three words are much, much larger than the rest of the text. Why? Because they believe in that political power. It's embodied in those first three words, we the people. The idea of our founding fathers was that we would be governed at the consent of the governed. We the people are beginning to say, enough! We're taxed enough already. That's what the Tea Party is all about. I'm a member of the Tea Party Caucus in the U.S. House. People don't understand the Tea Party movement, and it's not one entity, it's not a Tea Party. There are a lot of different Tea Parties. There's not, even in the biggest Tea Party group, the Tea Party Patriots, they have a few leaders who try to help coordinate things, but it's really a grassroots effort, county by county, community by community. But there's Americans for Prosperity, the 912, Freedom Works, even grassroots that have been around a long time like the NRA and Gun Owners of America. You see, the grassroots reflect we the people. And it's absolutely critical if we're going to change the kind of governing that we do in Washington. It's critical for you. It's critical for our colleagues. It's critical for your family, your friends, and everybody within your sphere of influence to get involved in this process. You see, we have the kind of government right now today that the American people have demanded. We've demanded to have a Marxist president, and we have one in Barack Obama. We've demanded that we have Socialists like Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid run the last two Congresses prior to this one. And I know 
many of you haven't been part of that demanding. I trust since you're part of apps that you were on the other side. But the uh, thing is, overall, America is demanding more and more government. We have to have a thought change here in America. How many times have you heard somebody say, What's, there ought to be a federal law about this? How many times have you heard that? Or what's the government going to do about that? You see, our founding fathers believed that governing should be very minimal. In fact, if you read in the Federalist Papers, James Madison wrote that the powers of the federal government are limited and few. But they've expanded. They've utilized the Commerce Clause, the General Welfare Clause, and the so-called Elastic Clause, the Necessary and Proper Clause, to expand the size and scope of government. Law schools don't teach the Constitution the original intent. What they teach is case law. I've become friends with Judge Aston and Scalia, as well as Judge Clarence Thomas. They're the only two who even care about the original intent. And we have presidents, Republican as well as Democrat presidents. We have congressmen, even conservative congressmen, who have perverted the Constitution and use a perverted idea about it to expand the size and scope of government. In Hosea 4, 6, God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And the only way that we're not going to be destroyed is to, if you turn that around, if we have knowledge, we're not destroyed. So I encourage you to read the Constitution. Read what our founding fathers said about it. And they said a lot. They wrote voluminously. They didn't have TVs and Dish Network and Direct TV and cable, and they didn't have Fox News and all the other radical leftist news sources. They wrote. They wrote books. They wrote letters. Three of our founding fathers wrote a series of essays that were published in the papers in New York State to describe in minute detail what government is supposed to be under the Constitution. They were written to try to get the people in New York State to ratify the Constitution. Those papers were bound together in a volume called the Federalist Papers. If you've ever read the Federalist Papers, probably more in this crowd have than most other crowds that I speak to, but it's very difficult reading because their style of English was different from ours. If you read the Federalist Papers, you can see what government is supposed to be. You can see that the Commerce Clause was not meant to control commerce, but was meant to expand it, to make sure that there was no block on state, by states to commerce across state lines. So when we can't buy health insurance across state lines, that flies in the face of the original intent. It was never meant for a court or for the federal government to control commerce at all. So we've got to become knowledgeable about that. And there's a great resource that I highly recommend. It's called the Federalist Papers in Modern Language. You can order it off Amazon or any of the bookstores can get it for you. It's in print today. The Federalist Papers in Modern Language. It doesn't editorialize, it's not a commentary, it actually just transliterates from the old style English into modern English. And it's indexed so that you can see at any clause of the Constitution where the Federalist Papers talk about that individual clause and that function of government. We've got to become knowledgeable. We've got to become active in this political process. Doctors have not been. The reason that we have all the stuff that we have to fight, the regulatory burden and all the, the encumbrances that you face in delivering care. It's because we have been silent pretty much for years. We've got more doctors in Congress now than we've ever had, I think, at least in modern times. But let me tell you a story. I was running for Congress several years ago it's a previous race that I was unsuccessful. And one of my colleagues 
classmates from the, from the medical college of Georgia, held a fundraiser, meet and greet fundraiser for me in his home, one of the major cities here in the state of Georgia. And at that fundraiser, we had a neurosurgeon there who told me during the, this meet and greet, he said, Paul, we've got to have more doctors in Congress, people who understand the problems that we face as we try to deliver care, people who look across the same desk I do and try to fight the federal government and try to deliver the care we're trained to, to give. He said, come to my office, I want to help you. I got there the next day, walked into really nice office, wood paneling. Uh, I mean, this was really a palatial place. Um, but he had golf pictures all over the wall. He even had a golf picture from a little, little known golf course I have down in Augusta, this part of my district. Y'all may have heard of it. It's called Augusta National. Anyway, so when the nurse surgeon came in, after seeing all these golf pictures in his waiting room, in his office, etc., just to start the conversation, I started, we started talking about golf. Any golfers in the crowd? A few of you. Most of us don't have time to go play golf, but at least if you're in primary care like I am. So we started about talking about golf. And I found out every weekend he was not on call. He was on the golf course on Saturday and Sunday. And there's a betting game in golf that's called a Nassau. For those of you who are not golfers, I'll explain very quickly. A Nassau is a betting game where you have one bet on the front nine, a second totally different bet on the second nine, a third bet on the 18 holes. So for a round of golf, you have three bets at a minimum. And anywhere along the line, you can concede one or more of those bets and do what's, what my buddies call freshing. So you can fresh. So typically, when people play a Nassau, they'll have four, five, six, eight different bets on one round of golf. I found out he was doing a $25 Nassau, which means he, does, he bets $25 on each one of those bets. I thought, oh boy, this guy is going to be a really good supporter of mine. <laughs> um, and so we got down to the nitty gritty. And he started off again. He said, Dr. Brown, we've got to have more doctors in Congress to help us as we deliver care to our patients. He said, I want to help you. I've got you a check. And he gave me a check for $25. $25. He thinks more of his golf game and his betting game with his buddies than he did his own career. And what kind of delivery he could give to his patients. Doctors have not supported organizations like apps. It's absolutely critical for you to do so because this is the voice, the only national voice for patient-centered, market-based healthcare solutions. That's the reason I joined it decades ago. And I'm sure it's the reason that you joined this organization. But we ought to have thousands of people at this meeting. <laughs> Support candidates who understand the problem. Support nurses and doctors who understand patient care and understand the marketplace and understand the problems that we face as caregivers. Give money to candidates. Some of the staff asked me to tell you about my re-election. I'd appreciate it. Check from all y'all. I hope each one of you will contribute. Go on paulbrown.com. It's B-R-O-U-N. paulbrown.com. You can put it on a credit card or there's a form you can download there. Here in Georgia, we've gained a new member of Congress, and so they've changed our districts. Mine was cut more than anybody else. My district was cut into three pieces. I only have 34% of my current district in the new one. And that 34% is based in Athens, Georgia, where the University of Georgia is, with the radical liberals 
It's a speck of blue and a sea of red politically. So I've lost my fundraising base and my Republican vote base. So if y'all can help, I'd appreciate it. I appreciate your prayers too. But help, help other people who are running. We have three physicians from Georgia. Dr. Tom Price, an orthopedic surgeon from Alpharetta, Dr. Phil Gingrey from Marietta, and OB Jen. We've got more physicians, more health care providers. I think there are 19 of us in the doctor's caucus in the house. Run for office yourself. I encourage your colleagues to. AMA used to, I don't know if they still do, they did the best political candidate school anywhere in the country. In fact, they st AMA started the candidate school, gave it to both the Democratic Party and the, as well as the, the uh, Republican Party. And both of those parties have carried that forward. There's an organization in, um, in Washington called the Leadership Institute. My good friend Morton Blackwell runs that. They have a candidate school. Encourage people to go and learn how to run for office. It sure is different than practicing medicine. But get involved. Because if we're going to save the ability for you to give the care that you've been trained to do, it's going to be up to you to do so. It's going to be up to we the people to change America. To start demanding a different kind of governance. Until we get engaged as much or more so as the trial attorneys, we're still going to get the short end of the stick. We're still going to be at the mercy of government bureaucrats. We're going to still be at the mercy of the politicians. So we need your help in Washington. Be a part of that army, that giant, that sleeping giant of we the people that's been asleep. Most of us are so busy that we, we try to take care of our issues at work. We want to go home and spend time with our family. We want to go to the movies or go to the mall or play golf or go hunting or fishing. But you see, your kids and your grandkids are going to depend upon what you do today, and particularly what you do in this next election to change America. And this shouldn't be a partisan issue either. As I told you, there were many Democrats that said, Paul, your bill makes more sense than what we're doing. Former U.S. Senator one time said, Said, and Eric Dirksen one time said, when he feels the heat, he sees the light. What he meant by that is that when enough of his constituents get in touch with him, by whatever means, whether it's a personal visit, whether it's a phone call, an email, a letter, any kind of personal visit, when he gets enough people saying, Buster, you're heading in the wrong direction, you don't change then we're going to make a change. Then they start feeling that heat and we'll see the light. There are many members of Congress that need to see the light. There are also many members of Congress that need to see the door. But you're the key to that. You're leaders in your communities. You can make a change. And your activity politically, your activity with apps, your activity in helping support folks, whether Democrats or Republicans, is absolutely critical for the future of this nation. You see, I'm really excited because I think we're going to see a new day in American politics. And it's absolutely critical for the future of this nation. You see, we shouldn't be deciding whether we're going to have socialized medicine or not. We should be deciding what's the best way to give the best quality care at the lowest price to our patients. Not as what's the best way for government to take it over. And there are Democrats as well as Republicans that are pushing the wrong way, and the Democrats as well as Republicans will go the right way. If you get involved in your own community. The future of medicine 
depends upon you, but the future of this nation. Your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren's future depends upon you and your activity today. So please join me in this fight. Not only to save the quality of health care and make it more affordable to everybody, but let's rebuild this nation. Let's keep that bright, shining star of liberty that has covered this nation for so long, continuing to cover America. And let's stop this slide to, towards socialism that Republicans and Democrats alike have led us towards. With your involvement, we can make a difference. We can be that shining city on the hill that Ronald Reagan talked about when he was President of the United States. You can do it. We can do it. I need your help. Thank you all. God bless you.